I hated the sound of walking footsteps, especially when one dragged their steps. I thought we had already been cursed by humanity to have them drag their terrible footsteps all over the world. I always tried to keep it low, and I would say that I was pretty good at it, considering I no longer saw the old mister who always walked right past my house every evening. A search by the police had showed up nothing either. I leaned back into my reclining seat and watched the sunset. It was beautiful. The world was beautiful. It would have been even more so without humans for whom my hate abounds. There was a fat stick of cigar between my lips, and I puffed the content in, taking a deep breath. I felt the warmth spread through my body before I realized I had shut my eyes to savor the flavor of smoke. Then it came. Oh God, no! My eyes sprang open on their own accord, and in the distance, I found the silhouette of a man against the setting sun. He was walking down the street towards me. I gritted my teeth to prevent myself from shouting at him. Humans had to leave the earth, and one by one, I had to clear out the most annoying ones first. I waited until he came close before I took in his face. He was an old man, frail with a white beard hanging down his chin. On his face, there was an annoying smile as if he knew what he was doing and was deliberately doing it. I watched him pass. Just before he passed, he stopped, staring right at me, and waved his hand. His eyes, black as night, twinkled just above the wrinkles beneath them. There was no time to make out the meaning of his wave, because he turned around and started walking away. For a few minutes after he walked past, I was stunned. Nobody ever saw me. Ever. That was why it was easy for me to walk into Wendy's and pick the largest hamburger and walk out through the door. I had never been caught, never been seen. Who was he? Every part of my body sprang to life at the same time. I knew I had to get him. I flung the fat stick of cigar away and went after the man. It didn't take me long to catch up with him. He was still dragging his feet and making the most annoying of sounds. As I approached, there was no indication that he could see me. The sound of cars and conversations floated from all sides of the road towards me. The lights were coming on in this part of the city, setting the ground awash with their brightness. I cradled the sharp knife in my hand as I stepped closer to the old man. When I buried the knife in the back of his neck, there was no scream, just a gasp as he collapsed to the ground. I let him fall as I pulled out the knife and wiped the steel against his clothes to clean them of his foul blood. Then I watched him for any signs of movement. He was not moving lying there as still as a statue. The first person that raised an alarm was a little boy. In no time, people surrounded the dead body chattering noisily. Someone called the police. No one noticed me as I turned and walked away from the scene. Little by little, humanity would be gotten rid of, and the earth would return back to its glorious state. I made my way to a Wendy's restaurant by the corner. This time, I decided to sit by the window and eat what I had swiped off the counter. I had stopped wondering why no one could see me. It seemed like I was in a bubble, a bubble that made everything that came close invisible. If I sat on a seat, no one would see the seat anymore. As I munched on the hamburger, my mind floated back to the time the old man waved at me. It had come as a thing of shock. There was no one there with me. Perhaps he was mad and seeing shadows. But what would that make me? The question was one that I had stopped asking myself. I knew who I was. I finished eating and leaned back against the seat watching people walk past, the sound of their footsteps grating on my ears. With my eyes shut, I imagined a world that was peaceful and calm, serene and beautiful, one devoid of every human. I jumped up from my seat and listened. Sure enough, the sound was still there, getting louder. Standing up did nothing to erase it. 
It was the footsteps of the old man, the one that I had just ended a few hours ago. No, I mumbled without even realizing that I was speaking. I rarely spoke. There was no one to speak to. The footsteps continued. I hoped I was making a mistake, but I knew I was not. I hardly ever made a mistake with the sounds of footsteps. I heard the sound of the second hand racing around the clock, but none of these sounds drowned out the dragging footsteps that was annoyingly coming closer to where I was. I stared outside through the glass partition, the difference between being inside here and outside there. Sure enough, the old, frail man came around again, his eyes black as ever, the white beard hanging down from his chin. He stopped, turned to stare at me, and waved. Then he continued down the road. My heart froze. His shirt was free of the bloodstains I had seen pooling around him not long ago. How was he still alive? My feet moved fast, taking me through the exit of the restaurant and out into the street. I started after the old man before realizing the knife was already out in my hand again. I moved quickly, almost running, aware that no one could see me until I got close to him. There were scars at his nape, many scars crisscrossing, so much that I could barely count. We got past a barber shop and I raised my knife. We walked past a toy store and I still had the knife raised. The old man stopped. I stopped too. The knife was still raised. You see the scars? The voice was cold and impersonal, fearless and flat. I swallowed. He was not supposed to see me now. You keep killing yourself, he said. Then he turned around to look straight into my face. I recognized it now. The eyes, darker than the night. They were mine. I had always loathed it, getting old and frail, dragging myself all over the place. What is this place? How is this happening? What? You die and die and die again, all by your own hand. Where? What is this? You are fighting yourself, he said. Then he turned and started walking away. Stop, I shouted. It was all so confusing that I saw myself in this man when he was everything I loathed. Make peace with yourself and your future, Tony. You are forty-five, and you are not getting any younger. He continued walking down the street. But how do you know me? I asked. I needed answers to the many questions bouncing around my head. I am you. Don't you see? I don't. Wait, wh what is this place? Your mind, Tony. Your mind. Try to live sometimes. With that, he continued walking into the darkness. I watched him go, a silhouette, a lone figure bearing so many questions, while I wondered what it was all about. Try to live sometimes, Dr. Kenzie said, sitting on the sofa facing me. She was young, and I did not feel like strangling her. You live in your head most of the time. Is it possible that this hate you have for humans is because of the death of your father and the nature of it? I remained motionless. My father had suffered before he died. It was heartbreaking seeing my hero reduced to that before the end, and I could offer him no help. The good doctor felt that that was why I felt so detached from humanity. That's why I hated them. Maybe, I said, feeling some of the hate seep away. We will all die. There is no need hating yourself. We will all grow old and die, and there is nothing wrong with that. So try to make peace with the past facts and move on while there's still life. Things are easier said than done, aren't they? If you're still with me now, tell me, my friend, 
Doesn't the idea of getting old and feeble scare you? The weather was cool. It was another day to go out to look for whoever was going to fall into my trap. Everyone in town knew who I was and were running from me, which caused me to wear a lot of disguises, changing them each time I was going out to do something to prevent people from trying to capture me because they recognized the mask. I had an addiction for girls who looked a certain way, and I didn't even try denying it anymore. The world knew it, and there was no point lying to myself and trying to hide from who I was. Girls with black, straight, and long hair who were slim and barely wore any makeup. I thought I was going crazy until I began to see them walk past me on the streets. I would stare and not be able to get my eyes off them until someone or something brought me back to my senses. I had approached some of them before, and they shunned me. Not once, not twice, and not even three times. I ignored it at first, thinking it was just my interest. But when it marked the twentieth girl that was going to do it to me, I knew something was going on, and I had to get whatever I wanted, no matter what it was going to take. The first I tried it with was the one I met at Wendy's drive through She was very pretty, prettier than those I had seen on the streets that piqued my interest. I followed her quietly till she was far away from where people were going to notice what I was doing. I wrapped a cloth over her face quickly, covered her mouth, and dragged her with me with my other hand to where I parked my car. Luckily for me, it was close to where I dragged her from. She struggled, but I was stronger than her. Luckily for me, all the other girls had been the kind that my strength conquered. I only enjoyed tying them down and watching them beg me to free them. After I was satisfied, I would release them. My eyes were always hidden behind a mask. None of them knew exactly who I was, but the town was now looking for the psych guy. There was a funny thing that was going on. I was sure there was someone else out there doing the same thing I was doing, because the girls that came out to talk about their experiences were not all those that I actually captured. It was either many girls just coming up to get pity from people, or there really was someone else. In remembrance of the time I did that, I decided to visit Wendy's again and be on the lookout for another girl I wanted to add to my collection. The place was quiet, and most of the girls that walked past me were not those I wanted. I hissed in frustration. I was expecting the day to go better. I noticed another guy just standing in the corner with sunglasses, and his head raised. He was observing things as well. I had to be smart with my move if there was someone else watching the area. Suddenly, my kind of girl walked past me. I followed her, and the guy I had noticed earlier followed me. I ignored it. It could have been that he was just going the same way accidentally, and I tried to get my mind off it. Though something kept telling me to back off from whatever I actually planned to do with the girl, I ignored it. I could not resist the girl now that I had seen her. I kept looking back for the guy, and he was still there, walking at exactly the same pace I was. Suddenly, I felt a push on my back, which made me almost fall. What the heck, man? I turned around. I knew it was the guy, but he was no longer behind me. I turned back to the front, and there he was, already grabbing the girl. I ran to them pulled the guy to the other side of the road and grabbed the girl for myself. I lost my balance as soon as the guy got up again. He slapped me hard and tried to grab the girl again. She knew what was happening and was already running for her life. We ran after her, yelling at each other on the way. She's, She's mine, mine, you moron. I, I spotted, spotted her, her first. first. We said at the same time. The look of fear on the girl's face as she ran pushed me to run faster. That was the exact thing I was looking for from a girl. I didn't know what the guy wanted. He tried to slap me again after we lost sight of the girl, but I pushed him to the nearest wall and pinned him there. His eyes were red and murder was written all over it, but I reciprocated it. I could be as crazy as he was, and even more. I picked the pen that was in my pocket and bored the sharp side into different parts of his skin while he screamed. I felt content at the sight and couldn't wait for him to start begging me just so I could tell him that I was better than him and he should not try to take what was mine anymore. Instead, he removed his sunglasses that were still fixed to his face. I wondered how. He broke it against the wall 
and picked one of the broken glasses to use over my skin. He had no remorse and looked so determined to do it. I tried to free myself, but he pinned me in the same position. Who is crazy now? He asked me and smiled evilly. I struggled to free myself, but it was at that moment that I knew he was stronger than I was and it was probably the end of the journey for me. Though I was not a believer, I began to say my last prayers as he placed the piece of glass on my skin and tore it in a straight, long line. Blood gushed out and my screams went higher. People had gathered to watch us. The noise must have attracted them. The girl we were chasing after was also there, staring at us with so much confusion. I succumbed and begged him, but he only kept the evil smile on and continued with what he was doing. It was the police siren that broke us up. He left me suddenly and I fell to the ground. I was weak and knew it was the end for me. As soon as the officers got to where I was, they placed cuffs in our hands. I knew that it must have been the girl who called them. If not, they would have thought I was the victim. The world was going to know who I was now. It had been a long time coming. Whatever had a beginning must surely have an end. Some people hated working from home. Not me. I loved it. Between the lack of commuting to and from that downtown fesshole of an office, and not having to listen to Janice talk about her decrepit mom all day, it was pure bliss. I'd also invested a sizable sum into a legendary computer setup some years earlier, and now I was finally going to be able to use it for something other than online shoot-em-ups. When the call went out that we needed to work from home while the pandemic swept through the country, I actually smiled. That was three years ago. Like most town, ours had its fair share of virus cases. But when the rest of the world returned to normal and people started going back to their offices, we stayed put. Why have an office at all? The company executives reasoned. If your workforce can do their jobs from their bedrooms, so that's exactly what we did, day after day. And I loved it. I got my groceries delivered, watched TV when I wanted, and I kept my boss happy by doing just enough actual work to not raise any questions. Some weeks, I didn't even leave the house at all. And then came the email from the Friendly Human Resources Department. Dear Jason, it said, We want you to be among the small group of employees who we are inviting to try a satellite office downtown. For those days when face-to-face -face interaction would be beneficial, a first session is scheduled for tomorrow, and we'd love for you to attend. I scanned each word again and again, before muttering, Yeah, screw off, to my empty room, and replying that, while I understood the benefits of face-to-face -face interaction, I was far more comfortable working from home. The next email wasn't so polite. This time it didn't come from the generic HR email address, but rather from one I hadn't seen before. It was a collection of numbers and letters, but with our usual company domain at the end. And if the address hadn't alarmed me already, the content of the email did. Jason, you should take up this opportunity. The last thing any of us want is for you to be found alone, dead at your desk, tomorrow at 3. I immediately forward the email to Roz, the nosy HR administrator who, until now, would have been the last person I'd talk to about anything. No sooner had I hit send on the email than my phone rang. It was Roz, demanding to know what sort of sick joke I was playing, and whether I knew that simulating fake company emails is a serious offense. Awesome. Thanks, Roz. Helpful as ever, I thought. I tried to put the email to the back of my mind. I got on with my tasks for the day, and as usual, was finishing up just in time for junk hunters to start on the TV. It was early afternoon, and I had nothing else on my to-do list, save for a few pre-scheduled emails going out through the afternoon to remind my boss I was still working hard. Around 4 p.m., I scanned through my inbox to see what else had come through while I had been laying on the couch. My eyes stopped at another email from the random address. This time, it was simply addressed to The Slacker. I clicked it open, and my screen glitched for a moment before coming back to normal. Jason, 
You ran to Roz like a kid running to their mommy, it read. That was a mistake. I can see you, Jason. I can see you in your shitty apartment. I can see the dishes in the sink and the blinds drawn closed. I can see you laying on your couch, watching TV when you say you're working. I can see it all, and I'm not impressed. My first thought was that someone had gotten access to the webcam which I had kept mounted to the top of my monitor for our morning meetings, where I presented my largely made-up to-do list, making sure it was longer than anyone else's. But that was unplugged. I always unplugged it in the afternoons, because I was paranoid about it randomly turning on. So how the hell did this person claim to have seen me? Listen, bud, I replied to the email. I don't know what you think you've seen, but I've got a lot of work to do, so whoever you are, just beat it, okay? An answer came back within seconds. Oh, Jason, it read. You don't get it, do you? I can see you. Right now, in that cracked leather chair with the broken wheel, with that green Nike hoodie with the soup stain on your left elbow, I'm going to give you one last chance to come clean, Jason. Tell your bosses what you really do at home all day or you'll regret it. I was flustered now. I looked down at the soup stain on my hoodie and the broken wheel on my chair. Every detail had been correct. I scanned the dim surroundings of my apartment, looking for any hidden camera lenses. Hell, I even peered through the blinds to see if anyone had trained a camera on me from outside the building. Nothing. The street outside was as bare as it always was. I was getting angry. Screw you, pal, whoever you are, I wrote. I hope you like watching guys on the internet, because that's probably what gets you off, you pervert. You don't scare me. You're a a dime-a-dozen keyboard warrior. I don't give a shit about you or what you think you've seen. No reply came this time. Minutes watching my email inbox turned to a whole hour. And by the time the sun went down, I chalked the whole thing up to some elaborate prank. Probably Charlie in IT. That guy was always trying to trip me up. By the time I'd heated up some leftover chili, watched a couple of shows on TV, and done a good amount of online gaming, I'd pretty much put it out of my head. I was picturing Charlie sitting in front of his own screen and thinking he'd gotten me good. The prick. I'd show him that I'd figured it out all tomorrow. It was 2am by the time I went to switch my computer off. As I clicked the icon to power down, my screen glitched again. Nothing happened, so I tried to click the power icon again. And again. And each time, nothing happened. Screw this, I thought, searching underneath the desk for the computer's actual power button. It wasn't recommended, but I was tired. I pressed my finger onto the metallic power button, and suddenly, a surge of electricity spread through me. I tried with all my might to pull my finger away from the button, but it was like I was glued to it, and the pain... The pain was unbearable. Every muscle was cramping. Every nerve ending was firing. My only sensation was intense pain. I'd do anything for it to be over. As I watched in horror, a new message came up on my computer screen. It looked like an official email from the HR department and contained only a few words. Enroll in the new satellite office as a full-time employee, it said, with boxes for yes and no marked beneath. I looked at the time. 2.59. This was it. I was going to die at the exact time the message had said. Unless, with all my remaining strength, I lifted my free arm and jammed my finger down into the Y key. Immediately I was released. The electrical surge stopped. My finger was released from the power button, and I lay panting on my apartment floor. When I looked up at my screen again, there were two fresh emails waiting for me. The first was from the HR department, thanking me for joining the Voluntary Satellite Office scheme and telling me to report there at 9 a.m. tomorrow morning. The second message was from the same anonymous account as before and simply said, Thanks for your cooperation, Jason. I'll be watching your performance closely from now on. I did join the office the next morning and have been working from there since this incident. However, I have changed my apartment 
and out of fear of getting those creepy emails again, I have chosen not to install any PC at home. Still, sometimes, at exactly 3 in the night, I feel a current running through my body and wake up in sweats. It's terrible. 